Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you, the visit are you a visitor to Jerusalem? And do you not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what, what is more, it is the third day since all took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things, then enter his glory. And, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, but it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was, in the when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning with what was while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together, and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen, and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he brought the bread. Amen. Amen. So probably kind of a, a reading that's probably been read in many churches uh, today, uh, this reading of this encounter. Um, you know, there are many different pieces of evidence which affirm the resurrection. A lot of us will know about um, the guy called Lee Strobel uh, and he wrote a book and in his book he called it A Case for Christ. Uh, there's also a film being made about it as well. Uh, we watched it here on the big screen at one point. But quite a few of us will probably know the story of Lee Strobel. Uh, Lee Strobel, his wife became a Christian. Lee Strobel wasn't a Christian, and his wife became a Christian, and he wasn't happy about it. And uh, Lee Strobel was a big lawyer, quite a high up lawyer, and uh, he well, thought to himself, I'm not happy with my wife becoming a Christian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of disprove Christianity so that she, and so that she doesn't become a, that she gives up her Christian faith. And he kind of thought about it, and he had a conversation with somebody, and someone said to him, well, if you can disprove the resurrection, if Jesus never rose from the dead, you disprove Christianity, Christians go home. Don't worry about it. Your wife won't be a Christian anymore because it's, you know, say, all right, I'm a lawyer. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to find out. And I'm going to disprove Christianity by disproving the resurrection. Lee Strobel, the story goes, in the end, found that the evidence is overwhelming concerning the physical resurrection of Jesus on that first Easter day. 
He looked at things like, well, maybe Jesus didn't die, but we know he did because the Romans were good at the job, and when they pierced his side, blood and water flowed. So we know he died. So leads for thought, well, maybe when I was investigating, they thought maybe the thieves, maybe some burglars, some thieves have, have, have stolen the body, but then they thought, well, hang on a minute. In the accounts, the only thing that was good, the body had gone, but what was still there was the, 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 the garments which Jesus was wrapped in. They were spices, and they were worth something, basically. They were, they were the thing, the body wasn't worth much, but the, the actual stuff he was, he was dressed in was worth something. So if they were still there, it can't mean the thieves that, were, that, uh, that stole the body. And then he thought, well, maybe Jesus, the body wasn't there on that third day because the Romans stole the body. But then he thought, well, that doesn't make sense either because when the Christians started to rise up proclaiming a risen Christ, which the Romans didn't like, if the Romans had stole the body, then they'd just pop the body out and go, no, we need to, he, we have risen. We've got it. He thought, that's not credible. And then he thought, well, maybe the disciples, maybe they stole the body. That's why the body wasn't there. But actually, he realised then that the disciples went on to die for their faith, die and become martyrs for what they believed. And if they really knew that Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, why would they become martyrs for something they knew wasn't true? So he thought, that's not the case. He thought, and in the end, when he put it all together, Lee Strobel, Lee Strobel realized that the resurrection happened. Lee Strobel became a Christian and uh, wrote the tale of the tale. But in all those things, one other major piece of evidence of Jesus rising from the dead is his appearance. Is his appearance to so many different people, <coughs> over 500 people, on many different occasions, over a 40 day period after his resurrection, before he ascended back to the Father. It's another piece of the jigsaw. He didn't just appear once to one person or whatever. He appeared over a 40 day period to many different people on many different occasions. The risen Jesus, they saw him. And I want to focus on one of those occasions today that really just read for us in Luke 24. Now that same day, it said Sunday, it would have been the Sunday, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened as they talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came and walked along with them. Verse 16 says, but they were kept from recognising him. And that's the first verse I want to really pick up on, because my first point today really is that so many people still do not know. Verse 16, but they were kept from recognising him. Jesus <coughs> turns up these two guys, these two disciples, discussing all that they'd seen. They've probably seen the, the death of Jesus on the cross, and they, 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 they were discussing all that was going on. And Jesus comes alongside them, the resurrected Jesus physically comes alongside them, but initially they don't recognise him. Now we're not sure why these disciples did not recognise Jesus straight away. It might be that they just never expected it. They probably didn't expect a risen Jesus to suddenly pop up and go. So maybe they just were like, heads down, not really expecting it. That's why they didn't <laughs> recognise him. Maybe they didn't recognise him, and there's lots of, that we don't really know, there's, there's different, um, possibilities here. Some people suggest they didn't recognise him because his risen presence was different from his presence before he went to the cross. Some people say he was different, he looked differently because he had this risen glory about him, so they didn't recognise him. Some people say, well, maybe they were just full of grief, so they didn't recognise him. I think, really, Jesus initially kept it from them so that they could learn something. But what I want to do is use this verse, verse 16, that they were kept from recognising. I want to use this verse again to remind us that today there are many, so many people in this world who do not recognise the risen presence of Jesus. Last week we played that game, didn't we, on, on Easter Sunday. Oh, there he is again. You see, so many people still have not found the risen Jesus. They live in ignorance, often unaware of their need of a saviour. 
and very much unaware of the presence of their Saviour today. People are blinded. They're blinded by secularism. They're, they're blinded by materialism. They're blinded by sin. They're blinded by the devil. Some have just not heard. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 says this, The God of this age, which is the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, <laughs> who is the image of God. Many people today are lost. Matthew, 20, Matthew 9 verses 36 to 38 when he saw the crowds talking about Jesus, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. Just look out in all of them, town centre any time. They are like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into the harvest fields, and we'll come back to that. But many people are lost. You look in society today, they are just like, <laughs> Edless chickens. I was using my apologies, Edless chickens, just wandering around. The Bible tells us that these people are not living as they were created. See, they were created to live in a relationship with their Creator, in truth, in worship, in purpose. And yet they are lost, the Bible tells us, and they are heading for destruction. You know, I've got someone I know, and, uh, they're kind of into all this new age positive energy stuff. And when I when I kind of know a bit a little bit about them, what I know, it kind of it seems to make them feel good. It sort of seems to work for them. And I thought to myself, well, it kind of would. Because it's based in deception. And they even have a bit of God in there as well. So they mix it all in, mix it all into right. A nice bowl with a crystal and a bit of nice energy and a bit of God and put it in a big bowl and mix it up and it feels good, feels right, the earth and all that. And I kind of think, it, well it would do because they're being deceived, but it's blinding them to the truth, right. blinding them to the truth of Jesus. And that's just one example. But in this world in which we live in today, you know and I know that there are so many, so many people do not recognise the risen Jesus. But then that takes us me on, because my next point is entitled by a point that's titled called Beautiful Moment, verse 31. So the two disciples have walked with Jesus, they've talked with Jesus, Jesus explained stuff to them, and then they, Jesus has broken bread with the disciples, and verse 31 says this, then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him. That's a beautiful moment. Then their eyes were open, and they recognised him. You know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about the seven wonders of the world. Do you know what the seven? I had to look them up. You know, I, and they still look different. Do you know what the seven wonders of the world are? Can anybody give me one? The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Hey, you know, that's not even up. That's not a magistic. See, the thing about it is, there's different lists, right? I realise there's different lists because I thought, the, the, I thought the pyramids were the part of the simple in the world. And the, apparently they're not now. Anyway, so. Petra. Petra's one in Jordan. Colossus of Rhodes. Taj Mahal. What are we going? Anfield. <laughs> Shocking. Get ye behind me. Any more? Where? Uh, well, you see, the pyramids are not now. Not the Grand Canyon. The lighthouse of something. The lighthouse of something. You were the, the Colosseum. The, the Colosseum room. So I've got. I, yeah, I've got the Colosseum, Petra in Jordan, the Shishan Itsu in Mexico. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Christ the Redeemer in Brazil. The Machu Picchu in Peru. Without hanging to. Without, I can now say it's a familiar thing, 
the Taj Mahal and the Great Wall of China. Well, that's my list anyway, that's why Google told me. I didn't realise it was an old one. Right. Why do I say that? Because I would argue that when a person recognises, sees and finds Jesus, it's one of the greatest wonders of this world. Amen. That's why we're talking about it. Verse 34. That moment in the game last week when somebody finds Jesus, they become a winner. It's when that spiritual truth penny drops. When that person moves and transfers from a place of darkness to light, transfers from a place of death to life. It's probably the greatest wonder of this world. Peter, Simon, Peter, Matthew 16. Jesus says to him, but what about you? He asks. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you the Messiah. The son of the living God, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. He knew in that moment, he may be before that, but he proclaims that sense of Jesus is God. He got it. The Roman soldier, Matthew 27, the Roman soldier who crucified Jesus when the centurion, verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and he exclaimed, surely this man was the son of God. <coughs> a penny dropped, yeah. a spiritual penny. Zacchaeus, Luke 19, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here, I, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and, I have and if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay them back four times that amount. Jesus said to him today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. You know what? It, there is nothing greater. There is, to me there is nothing more special when somebody finds Jesus for the first time. It's one of, well, I would argue, it's the greatest wonder of this world. And so many millions more have done so over the years and all around the world. And now it also includes many of our stories, many of our testimonies. When we found Jesus, <coughs> Many of you have got a story, a testimony of when, and I'm not talking about finding all these little characters last week in church, but something in your heart moved. Jesus, by his spirit. I used to, when I worked with young people, I've probably used this illustration before, uh, I used to, the way I used to use it for me is I used to say to young people, who can remember those, what I used to call them, illusion pictures. The illusion pictures were just like coloured blobs loads of colour blobs. You looked at it and it just looked like a picture of coloured blobs. But there were 3D, it's, there was a picture, there was a 3D image inside the coloured blob, blobs. And for ages I could never see the 3D image. I, people would say, oh look there's a spaceship inside there. And I'm like, it's just coloured blob. And they say, no oh, look there's a dinosaur in this one. I'm like, no it's just coloured blob. There's not a 3D image, you're winding me up. And I can remember that one day being in Harrogate Town Centre and there was a guy and he had these massive big ones on the pavement and me and my mates were stood by them and my mates there, look there, you can see the spaceship, there you can see there's a hamburger in that one and I'm like, it's coloured blob. And then somehow I must have twisted my eyes slightly differently and suddenly, oh! <laughs> could see inside this picture, this 3D image that sort of, and I, and I worked it out and I must do it and I could go around them all and I could see these different colour pictures that had these, no wonder, no longer were just coloured blobs, but they had these images, these 3D images inside of them and I could see it. <coughs> the hymn writer John Newton puts it better. He says this, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It's a wonder of this world. Beautiful moment. 
you know, I've been watching, you know, you, you know when you get flicking on YouTube and all that, wasted time, <laughs> come on, <laughs> I see those hands, there's plenty of them, I got, the other, the other day I got into flicking around, um, it was like ex-service, no, it wasn't ex, it was servicemen, it was people in the service, particularly America, who would come home and surprise loved ones. So their loved ones often they hadn't realised that they'd come home. They were on their way home and they were coming home. So they, they'd be in like a, a you know like a stadium and their husband who they thought was had been away in Afghanistan for a year and suddenly he was a mascot and he'd take his, his hat off and this his, his, you know his wife or his girlfriend would be like oh! and they'd run and swing around the hole. Or the kids would turn up at the kids' school game and stuff like that. And, and I watched these, and I'll tell you what, I would cry it. They were beautiful moments. I don't, know, I don't know these people whatsoever. But there was something in these people coming home. And I thought to myself, it's the prodigal son, isn't it? You know, when the father sees the prodigal coming home, the love, he runs and he puts his arms around them. Welcome home. You were lost, but now you're found. You were blind, but now you see. Beautiful moments. You know, I can remember being at a number of events where people would come forward to give their lives to Christ. It would send a shiver down my spine, and I would be emotionally moved when you see somebody coming to Christ. When you see somebody for the first time, you know they're responding properly to the, you know, their heart is turned to Jesus. And I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose that emotion. And I feel like again, we can do it. It can become a thing or not a thing. I don't want to lose the wonder of somebody who doesn't know Jesus discovering Jesus. Who somebody who's lost becoming found. Who suddenly somebody who recognises Jesus for the first time. It is the greatest wonder. It is amazing. It is beautiful. So in this story today, just these couple of things, initially the first is just reminds us that there are so many people that don't know Jesus in this world in which we live in today, but there are these beautiful moments when, when the lost can be found in Christ. It's the wonder of the world. My final point is a little bit more to us as God's people because it's this, I put, they, they knew but they didn't know. You know, the suggestion was that these two men on the road to Emmaus were Jesus' disciples. They were certainly close enough to know that some women um, and some of Jesus' disciples had discovered the other two. So they were close. There is perhaps even a suggestion that they were part of the Last Supper because when Jesus broke the bread, they recognised it. So these were close to Jesus. They were his disciples. So they knew, but yet in other ways they didn't know. What do I say? <coughs> I say that because when Jesus appeared to them, they didn't recognize him. Now we've talked before about there could be a number of reasons why they didn't recognize Jesus when he appeared to them. But also when they talked about Jesus, they talked about him as a prophet. So they knew but actually they didn't know, because we know that Jesus was far more than a prophet, wasn't he? He was <coughs> God with us. So they knew and they didn't know. Also, when they spoke with Jesus, they talked about the way that they, they hoped that Jesus was going to restore Israel. And what I mean by that is they were still caught up in old school thinking about how Jesus was going to save. So they knew, but they didn't know. Also, their faces were downcast. They might say, well, of course they were. They were sad that Jesus, is, uh, Jesus had died. But it also suggests that they didn't understand. Because even Jesus himself calls them foolish. He said to them, how foolish are you? And how slow to believe that, that what the prophet has spoken. 
Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that this is what was said in all scripture concerning himself. So these <coughs> disciples of Jesus, and I believe they were followers of Jesus, they knew. But actually also they didn't know. And you look at it closely, you can see that. And as a church leader, pastor, caretaker, whatever you want to call me, and I hope it's polite, that's just take polite. <laughs> but I have a deep concern about this, rightly or wrongly, if I'm honest. See, I feel there are many Christians who know Jesus, but actually then, what they believe, what they say and their actions show that also they don't know Jesus. And I have to let this be a challenge to me also, actually. I have to hold this mirror up to me as much as I'd like to think about holding it up to you guys today. See, I think there are many Christians in this position where they know, but they don't know. And you can see that they know in some ways, but then when, they, when you hear them talking about some things, and you think about actions and words about some things, and you think, hang on a minute, they know, but they don't know. And I say that is because I want to help people not just find Jesus, not just know him a bit, not just get him a bit. What I want is for people to be totally transformed by Jesus, by a Jesus relationship. I want people to totally pursue following him and develop a deep knowledge and understanding of what it means to follow him and to be a Christian. So when I'm talking about bringing people to, into a relationship with Jesus, the greatest wonder in the world ever, but I don't want it to stop there. I want people not just to grab a bit, not just to know a bit, not just to be caught in different ways, I want people to be sold in by a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. To become not just a believer, but a true disciple of Jesus. All in, committed, sacrificial, foundation, Jesus woven into every area of who they are. I always hold on to, again, one of the, an illustration that Clive Calver, some of you have heard of Clive Calver, he used to work the Evangelical Alliance. I remember him preaching at Spring Harvest once and he said, our lives are like a hotel. And in your hotel of your room, you've got all these different rooms, a room for for your social life and a room for your church life and a room for your family life and a room for your um, your home life and all these different rooms in your life, all these different groups that you go to, all these different things that make up your week and you think, you've got all these different rooms in your life. And he says he fears that sometimes what Christians do is they let Jesus into some of those rooms, but then they lock him out of others because it's easier to do so. It's easy to let Jesus in when I go to church. Hey, I'm a church, I'm a Christian, but be my friends. But when I'm out with my non-Christian friends, Maybe I'll just knock him out because it's easier. I can I can cope better. Or when I'm at work and the pressure's on, and let's just shut Jesus out for a minute. Sorry, Jesus. <coughs> can you stay in this room? It's easier. And Clive Calvert, I remember I still remember the challenge to let Jesus into every single room of our lives. Yeah. Not just to know a bit, but to fully desire a deep relationship with Jesus. In every single area, woven into everything that we are. And I don't just want to get someone to come to church. However important I feel church has to be for a Jesus follower, I am sold into church. I don't think you can be a Christian and not be in fellowship. Well, I think you can be, but you're going to struggle really heavily. It's not what God intended for you. So if you're a Christian and you say to God, I don't need to go to church, then you're saying to Jesus, well, I don't need to do what you ask me to do. Being in church is really important. But I don't want to get people to just come to church. And then our Lent course, we had a really good discussion because on the last session of our Lent course, there was a story from Open Doors about this guy whose church had burnt down. And it was like, well, what do we do? Our building, the, the, the Boku Quran had come in and burnt our church down and flattened it. And we had a discussion in our group, oh my goodness, what happens if that happened here? If someone came and burnt our church down, if we were persecuted and terrorised or whatever, and the building and the flat of it, and what would we do? 
And I'm like, you know what, so what? We're not about church, we're about Jesus. That's who we should be attached to. Yeah, we'd be gutted and we'd be sad, and, but then we'd just have to find ways of being in fellowship elsewhere, wouldn't we? Because it's not about, <laughs> I'm not a church, I'm a Christian, a churchian, well, one of them is. I'm a Christian. <coughs> What's important is Christ. And nothing can take Christ away from me. Because he lives in here. Amen. And I want to get people not just to go to church, but to be sold into Christ. Totally sold into Jesus. It has to be all be about him. It really, really does. I'm going to pray a little bit about that. Challenge you a little bit more. We all we do, we're going to sing. And we're going to sing the song Amazing Grace. Because it reminds us. It reminds us of the grace that we all are dependent on, isn't it? Let's sing it as a testimony today. <laughs>